Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, friends and neighbors, and all peoples, welcome to episode four of the Garden of Ruin. In this episode, we'll explore codependency and what turns somebody into such a bleeding heart. Have you ever known somebody like that, that they give such priority or place people who are so troubled or so damaged on such high pedestals? They make excuses for dysfunctional people or they're always caring for people that may not even want to be cared for or that may be so damaged or harmed that there's really nothing that anyone can do on a level of friendship or or romantic relationship or otherwise to help that person. That, that harmed person may just need very deep psychological help or, you know, rehabilitation services and things like that, but this individual can't stop enabling them or just can't stop helping them feel safe with their bad behaviors. And so what makes somebody like that? What experiences lead somebody to become codependent or to have the bleeding heart, as so many of us call it? Well, codependency most often comes from chaotic childhoods that a child may grow up in a home that is dysfunctional in a way where the child feels scared often or unsafe or there may be a lot of manipulation happening within the home. A lot of family members blame other family members for their own bad behaviors or it could be a very secretive or an aura of denial that lives within the family about someone being wrong or someone doing something inappropriate. And there then become these like unrealistic expectations for the children in the household is that the kids may end up having to become caretakers for troubled parents or other siblings. And they may have to be peacemakers in tense situations or scary dynamics for kids. And so the, the neural pathway formation that happens for these children a lot of times or people in these situations is they think that their value is measured by what they're doing for other people or how they're helping people that are not well. And this, what's even worse or even I think further continued with these situations is that a lot of times these children then see very, very toxic behaviors but because their neural pathway formation is incorrect or it's so normalized, they wouldn't see an adult having a temper tantrum as a giant red flag. And they wouldn't see someone living with severe alcoholism as a reason to move away from that person. Their neural pathway formations that happened in their formative years where they were taking care of people that may have had problems like that are ones where they then ended up end up thinking not, oh, well, this person has a lot of issues going on. They have a lot of things that they need to work on, and I need to move away from this person to stay safe. They instead say to themselves, oh, well, this person just needs help. The same way I was able to help my family with certain things like that when I was a child, I became very good at that. I can help this person, and then they'll be better. And, of course, that very rarely ever works or most often never works, you know, especially with the things that, you know, we know popular culture for codependency is typically with people who are living with substance abuse problems and stuff like that or very self-destructive or relationship sabotaging behaviors that really can only be managed with a psychiatric support or, you know, group therapy and, and support groups and stuff like that. But this, these experiences that this person had when they were in their formative years, it did not allow them to see red flags the way that someone who may have come up in a, a more healthier childhood or a more healthier environment can identify certain behaviors as toxic or very inappropriate past a certain age. So when we think about that, when we see this person who will cut off their foot for someone who wouldn't do the same for them or would 
constantly make sure that their drunk friend or their drunk partner gets home safe every night from the bar or is always taking care of them. Maybe shelling out their wallet for giving all their money to people who are missing rent or doing things like that. Then instead of doing something which would be a much more healthy thing to do, to say, you know, look, these problems you have as an individual are very pronounced, and I suggest you seek help for them. And then even maybe putting up friendship boundaries and saying, like, I don't think we can hang out anymore because of what you're doing, or unless you can manage this or do something for that, we can't be around each other anymore. Instead, they just give more and more to them, hoping that they'll get better. And when we see that, of course, it's never okay that things like that happen. And it's that individual's responsibility to change how they act. It's their responsibility to get their own help and to do those things that make those, those patterns of behavior better. But just when we see it, it helps us understand why they may be acting that way or what may have happened to have them acting that way now. If we look at our drawing today, we see a character with its arms reaching out, wanting to give so much and wanting to love so much that it's crying. And on the right, the character is now so exhausted that it's being consumed by this bad root or this bad bark that's just encapsulating and is almost eating its face now. And it's drooling. It's unable to help itself. It's unable to help anything. As a bleeding heart just kind of bleeds dry. Thanks for listening. We'll see you in the next episode.